five and three, two, one. So that's the secret of life? Yeah, true story. I never knew. Yeah. Hello, welcome to a very special Spark Fun Live. Today, well, I'm Mike. And I'm Mike. Today, we are going to be building a very special box, um, the Hatermatic. The Hatermatic is an incredible advancement in the technology of insults. What you do is you put in money into the coin, coin acceptor, press the button, and out comes an insult. You are not a good person. You know that, right? Let's see. Mike's going to show you how to build this guy. And if you want the parts list, if you're watching on YouTube, well, of course you're watching on YouTube. Down below us in the text, there should be a link to both the wish list at sparkfun.com. And if you want the code, it is up at GitHub in the GitHub repository. There's also a uh, circuit diagram in the GitHub repository and some uh, written directions about how to set things up for you as well. Cool. So Ready let's get, get started. started. Um, before we go any further, we're just I'll just uh, <coughs> give you the little walking tour here. As you can see, I've built this in a SparkFun red box. Um, we have a few of those around. Uh, so. One of the problems with using the red box is that the, uh, the coin acceptor is a little bit too deep, so it pops out the back. Uh, the nice thing is that I could cut it up and, and uh, play with it, be able to show what was going on fairly easily. So I've elected to do a breadboard instead of a uh, soldered solution because I didn't really feel like messing around with solder, honestly. Um, so basically, most of our assembly is going to be hooking up the wiring harnesses and uh, putting the board, putting the, the wire, the connections into the board here. Uh, one thing that you'll notice, um, there are two uh, little barrel jacks on here and two power supplies. That's because the printer needs a 5 to 9 volt supply and the coin acceptor requires a 12 volt supply. Um, we do have a fun little 5 and 12 volt supply that has a Molex connector on the end. And I originally tried using this, but it turns out that the surge current for the printer when it he heats up the heating element to, to print on the paper was too high for this power supply to source. And so the power supply would brown out and just kind of go to crap whenever I tried to print anything. So. I went ahead and replaced that with a 9 volt supply of the sort of standard wall wart adapter sort. Um, and one of the things that I did for this, and this is kind of something that I do uh, standard on all of my power supplies that are floating around my office, I take a, uh, a little Sharpie uh, metallic ink pen like this and I write the voltage on the end of the barrel connector and then put a little piece of scotch tape around it. And that way I always know which end of the power supplies uh, associates with which voltage power supply at the other end without having to follow it back into the nest of cables underneath my desk. And all of us around here have 5 volt, 12 volt, 9 volt wall warts. And like Mike says, when you got a whole bunch of these on your desk, you don't want to push the wrong one into the wrong, wrong thing. So. <laughs> To get started, the first thing we're going to do here let's see. The computer that this is based on is a 5 volt? 5 volt, yep. 5 volt Arduino Pro Mini. Um, this is one of the boards we have at SparkFun. Um, it's a little tiny Arduino compatible computer. Um, very, very handy for projects because it's not very expensive. Retail price on that is $10. Um, and I use that uh, because it was inexpensive. And I like to use those in the sort of projects like this one where you're going to leave it embedded at the end. It's a lot cheaper than most of your other Arduino-based solutions, certainly like an, an Uno or a Leonardo or something like that. It's, it's much cheaper. Um, so uh, 
You can, I will say, you can do this project with any other Arduino that you happen to have uh, hanging around. Um, I can't seem to find the breadboard that I was going to use for this. <laughs> so I'm just going to pull this thing apart and I'll uh, start from scratch on the bare board. So you can see that I've got this guy in here and it's pretty hard to get ah, <laughs> in and out. A little first, bit of blood. First aid. Um, so the other thing that I did was I, I, I also took a, uh, a standard Sharpie, just a regular black Sharpie, and I wrote uh, on here the voltages that I expect to plug into each one of these barrel jacks so that, again, I don't get confused uh, and accidentally plug the wrong thing into the wrong barrel jack. In particular, if you were to plug the 12-volt power supply into the supply for, the, uh, for that printer, you might actually damage the printer. So um, be careful of that. Um, these are on the wish list. This is the, uh, the little breadboard compatible um, barrel connector that we sell. Uh, it is a five and a half millimeter OD by 2.1 millimeter ID connector and that mat, uh, that mates with all of the um, the barrel jack ended power supplies and things like that that we sell. Um, I've just gone ahead and jammed these into the board. Um, if you wanted to, uh, it would not be at all inappropriate to just take um, like a hot glue gun or some epoxy or something and just backfill all over on top of those two to keep them from, from coming out of, the, uh, out of the board. Of course, before you do that, you want to make sure that you've got your wires in place so that you don't fill in the holes and glue it in place before you've, uh, before you've connected them. Um, so. The trick that I use when I'm putting the headers on one of these guys, I go ahead and uh, size it out like this, snap my length. So now I've got my one set of headers, another set of headers. And then just to make it kind of easy, <coughs> throw it down in the, uh, in the breadboard here and just push it down on in there. And so now you can see my, my uh, Arduino, my Pro Mini, is just kind of floating there and it's sitting on top of these guys. But that keeps these headers nice and, nice and parallel, uh, nice and parallel with each other so that, uh, so that it goes in and out more easily and you're not splayed at some weird angle. So I'm going to go ahead and solder these on here. Take me just a sec. Using flux there, Mike? Nope. Using leaded solder. Um, as I, I think I mentioned this, uh, I, I'm a big evangelist for leaded solder uh, because it, uh, it works and lead-free solder doesn't. Um, I, uh, some people might worry a little bit about the, uh, the environmental impact of the leaded solder. Uh, it's an interesting argument um, because obviously lead is not a good thing. Um, but it turns out that some of the organic compounds that are used in uh, lead-free solder are actually uh, a lot more toxic than uh, one would hope to be exposed to. And uh, another thing about lead-free solder is that it melts at a higher temperature. So all of the production lines that have gone over from leaded to lead-free are using higher temperatures and spending more money and wasting more energy because they have to do it lead-free instead of leaded. The other problem is that lead-free has some, uh, some quality issues uh, over time. And uh, so there's a good likelihood that you're going to see reliability in electronics decrease the longer we have, uh, have been using lead-free solder. For my personal workbench purposes, I just like leaded because it melts better and it flows better. All right, so we've got our joints all soldered down here. The next thing we've got to do 
is uh, we've got to put a, a six pin programming header on the end here. So I'm going to snap off six pins. Whoops. Got one extra. Uh, use a nice little pair of these uh, Hako side cutters that we sell. These are really nice. Um, there are cheaper, uh, cheaper brands of side cutter out there, but uh, none better, in my opinion at least. Um, so the trick that I'm going to use here, you'll notice that I have got a standard uh, straight header, uh, straight pin header, but I'm wanting to put this on here sideways. There's no reason I, cannot, I can't do that. In, in order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a little bit of solder on this pad right here. And then I'm going to lay that on there, being careful not to touch the pin that I'm going to be soldering because that pin is going to get really hot all the way out to the tip instantly. And so now you can see that one on there, it's held in place. And now we can just go along and tack all of the others down. I could also, of course, have just put that on there uh, at a right angle to the board so that it's sticking up in the air. Eh, I find that offensive. <clears throat> Clean the tip of my iron a little bit. And uh, one more thing that I'm going to do before I move away from the Arduino. Um, you'll notice that uh, on the header here, one of the pins is for VCC. Um, and that connects to the five volt supply on your FTDI cable, your FTDI basic, w whatever it is that you're using to, uh, to program this thing. I'm going to cut that pin off. And I'm going to do that because I don't want uh, I don't want any kind of power supply, um, like bus contention issues between the power supply that's feeding this and the power supply that's coming from that FTDI. It's not really necessary. There's some circuitry on here to kind of uh, get away from that happening. But it's just something that I kind of like to do. Um, that way I know uh, that my pow where my power's coming from and I know what's going on there. And also, if you did accidentally plug 12 volts into the 5 volt supply and it was hooked up to your computer, it could save your computer. Exactly. Or at least save one port of your computer. Um, OK, so we've got this all in place. Um, the next thing that we've got to do, we have to prepare the wiring harnesses for these two, uh, two devices that have wiring harnesses, the, uh, the printer and the coin acceptor. Both of these things come with a nice pre and attached. Uh, let's see. I think we're on this camera. So they come with a uh, a nice uh, a nice header um, with connectors attached that can be plugged directly into the, uh, the back of these devices. Um, the one for the printer actually has, uh, has a connector at both ends. And um, the one for the coin acceptor has a connector only at one end. Uh, there are two wires, two cables for the, for the printer, one for data and one for power. And then the coin acceptor has got only the one which handles, uh, which handles data, it handles power, it handles a couple of uh, simple signals. The coin acceptor, you can see, also has this 10-pin output on it. Um, that's uh, sort of a, like a standard 0.1-inch uh, header 10-pin. You can connect to that if you want to. The signals coming out of that are different to the ones on the 5-pin on the header. And I like the ones on the 5-pin header better. The 5-pin the, the header has a serial output. Um, it's got a couple of other signals that we aren't going to use that can come in really handy. Uh, so I, and also, of course, it comes with the, with the, uh, the pigtail. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and snip off the end, one of the ends of the power cable 
And this is to the printer, right? This is for the printer, the power cable and the data cable for the printer. You'll notice that I'm, I'm cutting these ends kind of short. I'm leaving these ends kind of long. Um, the reason I didn't just cut these right at the connector is because I am paranoid about waste and I would like to potentially be able to use these again someday. I never will. They'll sit in my junk box forever, but you know, that's how it is. Um, so since we're doing this all on a breadboard, all we're going to actually do is we're just going to put a, uh, a couple of pins on the end of each one of these wires and then put some heat shrink cable or, or some, some heat shrink tubing around the end of that uh, where that joint is to connect it so that it, uh, it stays and we take the, the heat shrink takes some of the strain off of the solder joint and prevents that joint from getting worried over time and, uh, and ultimately breaking. So you're kind of making your own little jumper cable. Exactly. We're going to make our own little jumper cable set um, with the adapter, with the uh, the pin on the end that we, uh, or the connector on the end that we need. So we take our wire cutters, we strip off, uh, yeah, maybe a quarter of an inch, a little bit less of. Um, of wire on the end. And then what we're going to do is, uh, what I like to do for something like this, is I'll take my, I'll take my trusty little third hand here. Um, this, is, uh, this is the SparkFun improved third hand. Um, this, I, ITH for short. Yes, it, it, uh, it revolutionized my life. I love this thing and I, yeah. It's an amazing uh, tool. So. I'm actually going to move that stuff. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tin this wire slightly. I'm just going to melt, kind of touch my, uh, my iron and my solder and the tip of it all together at the same time so that I get a nice little coating of solder on the end of that wire. So Mike, why, why wouldn't you just stick this into the breadboard? Why would you solder a, an extra pin onto it? Well, this is stranded wire. Mike brings up a very good point. This is stranded wire, and uh, sticking stranded wire into a breadboard is a recipe for disaster because <laughs> some of those strands will, uh, will over time break off and work their way loose, and then those strands will migrate to different places inside the breadboard and pretty much make you want to hate your life. Um, so uh, you could put a little bit of solder on here like I've done and then stick that soldered end, a little sort of stiff end of the solder into the breadboard, um, you're still running the risk of this, this point right here where the solder is, uh, where the, the soldered wire meets the non-soldered wire. Um, as that bends right where that joint is, that's going to get brittle and eventually that's going to break. And when that breaks, if you've got this end plugged into a breadboard, it's going to leave that behind and you're going to basically ruin one of the, uh, one of the uh, buses on your breadboard. So I, generally speaking, I, never, I would never plug a stranded wire into a breadboard. Um, you always want to put something on the end of it uh, to avoid those sorts of uh, dangers. Very cool. All right, so we're going to put a little bit of uh, solder on there. I'm going to go ahead and tin all of the ends of these, uh, these wires. Um, and while I'm doing that, Mike, do you want to tell, uh, tell our audience a little bit about the uh, upcoming autonomous vehicle competition? Ah, uh, yes. Um, this June at SparkFun, we're going to have our yearly autonomous vehicle competition. Last year, we held it out at the Boulder Reservoir. We are going to continue doing that because it's a lot of fun out there. We've got basically two courses. One is a ground course where you have to navigate a vehicle, or you don't navigate your vehicle, your, your vehicle navigates itself all the way around a parking lot. We're going to have some cool obstacles there. Um, we also have an aerial course um, where you, you fly your, your vehicle out over the reservoir. It has to do a couple tasks, come back and, and land back in the landing box in order to get points. Um, take a look at our website. Uh, we're going to have balloons as well this year. Um, they're going to be randomly placed around the course. They'll be big red balloons. And if you can pop one of these balloons, you'll get extra bonus mega points. So um, take a look at our website and um, 
you'll find out information about that. And definitely come out to Colorado, enter a vehicle, come out to spectate. It's a really good time. Are you entering one this year, Mike? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've often said actually that if they had, if we were to um, to change a, add a class of vehicle that was a little bit smaller than the ones, um, the course is I think about a quarter mile long usually, and uh, and I just, I my attention span's not long enough for that. Um, I mean that's really what it boils down to. <laughs> So uh, if we had a, a smaller thing, you know, maybe like a 12 by 12 foot thing, I would consider, uh, I'd consider doing an, an entry, but, uh, but we're, not this year. We're, we're always talking about expanding it to both smaller things and larger things. And since we're at the reservoir, it'd be really cool to have a, a water course for watercraft. Uh, we yeah. haven't quite gotten there yet, but um, look for that in the future. And also, it, when you go to our website to learn about ABC, at the top, you'll see a couple tabs up there, one for shop and one for learn. And there's a third one for ABC, so click on that tab. You can find all the rules and the dates and times and everything. So definitely get involved. It's a good time. All right, so I've tinned the ends of all of my wires, stripped them down, and tinned the ends slightly. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tin the ends of all of these pins on my header. Same sort of thing. Touch the soldering iron to the pin. Touch the solder to the point basically where the iron and the pin are meeting. And you'll see a little bit of solder just flow right onto the pin. Um, if you're one of those unfortunate souls who is actually using uh, lead-free <laughs> solder, um, go ahead and flux the crap out of both the ends of your wires and your pins before you start uh, trying to solder these things on there. Because otherwise, your attempt to pin to, to tin those pins, it, it's just going to, it's not going to work. Um, Can you say crap on YouTube? I just did. Crap. Okay, so uh, at this point, the, the canonical mistake uh, that I always make is to forget to put my heat shrink tubing on before I solder the connection. Um, in this case, it's not such a big deal because once we've soldered these connections, we're going to go ahead and pull the pins out of the, uh, out of the little plastic holder, which means we could slide it on there anyway. But um, I, as this is an educational program, I, uh, I do want to uh, educate the, uh, the masses on the uh, sorrow, which is fig forgetting to put your heat shrink on before you... Um, kind this, of have to experience it. Yeah. This is a 332nd inch heat shrink. It's just some that I happen to have lying around. Um, if you are following the, uh, the wish list, I suggested that, that you purchase a, an assortment, a heat shrink tubing assortment, and that's got some in there that is, um, I think there's some two and a half millimeter or something like that. Big, yeah, big, small, uh, medium. Um, extra small. It's always good to have around and you never quite have the right size that you need so the assortment packs a good idea. Um, and, and if you've never used this stuff um, and you've always used kind of like uh, I don't know electrical, electrical tape, tape stuff like that uh, you are in for a real treat the first time <laughs> that you use heat shrink tubing. Um, it is it is just a, a wonderful invention um, you know right up there with uh, sliced bread and the ding dong. And let me remind you guys, while Mike's tubing his wires, um, that you can ask questions on our YouTube feed. So, if you got any questions, ask them and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. They don't necessarily have to be related to what's going on on the program either. You can ask us general questions about SparkFun, um, Colorado, um, romance, what, romance, bromance, romance. Um, cooking. Um, I think Mike's pretty good at crochet. Uh, and if we can't get the answer, we will pull in whoever we need to. We will wake them up. So this is the point where uh, tinning the wires and tinning the, uh, tinning the pins pays off. Um, because there's solder on the pins and on the wires, all I have to do is touch the 
touch the pin with the tip of my soldering iron and then touch the, the tinned tip of the wire to that melted solder and voila. This is a, a lot easier than trying to hold the solder and the wire and the soldering iron all at the same time. A uh, little I've trick that was taught to me by a Tibetan monk. <laughs> I really hope that either we can genetically engineer a third hand onto ourselves or find aliens that have three hands, because... I'm there. Okay, yeah. so now we've got our, uh, we've got our five, five, uh, five little wires soldered in place. We've got our five heat shrink tubes on there. I've got a heaterizer. 3,000. 3,000? 3,000. 3, um, and uh, this is this is a hot air gun. Um, it's basically a glorified hair dryer. Uh, it's it gets a little hotter than your average hair dryer. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> what do I say? Glorified. Um, Maxified. Please, please, please do not try and dry your hair with this. Uh, and probably don't try and shrink heat shrink tubing with a, a hair dryer. You might, you might, but probably not. Um, if you're in a pinch, if you're in a hotel room somewhere and you have no other option, it's, it's better than the lighter, which, which we've done as well, but heat gun's your best option. Second best might be uh, a soldering iron, if you just hold the soldering iron tip underneath it or kind of, uh, kind of stroke the, uh, the heat shrink tubing with the tip of the soldering iron. Uh, if you just want to like kind of pretend that the, the heat shrink is, is like a pet of some sort and you're giving it some affection, that's good. Um, so then uh, I'm going to go ahead and just pull these out, wink, one at a time. Wow. And while it's, uh, while it's nice and warm from uh, either soldering or the application of the heat shrink, it'll be a lot easier to get these pins out. Um, so don't be afraid to, uh, to maybe warm them up a little bit. So now we've got, we have our, our harness for the, uh, for the coin acceptor uh, with the nice little connectors on the end. And that'll plug into the back end of the coin acceptor right there in the little white, uh, little white connector plug. So there you go. Sweet. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, repeat the process here for the, uh, for these other guys. So Mike, do both of these things talk serial? They do. Um, the, uh, I'm actually gonna leave the thermal printer set up the way it uh, originally ships. Um, see, you got me talking. I almost forgot to put my heat shrink on oh, there. See? It couldn't fool you though. Um, I'm going to leave that configured the way it is, and then I'm actually going to change the baud rate on the, uh, the coin acceptor um, to a slightly different baud rate than it ships with. And then I'm going to use the uh, uh, software serial library in Arduino to communicate with the two devices. Um, normally, I like to avoid software serial if I can, because it, uh, it has a pretty significant drain on the resources of the uh, the Arduino, but um, in this case, because it's the Arduino won't be doing anything while it's waiting for the serial data to come in, uh, then I can go ahead and waste those resources. They're they're not needed for anything else. Let's see. And I'll remind our viewers again that if you do have any questions, you can ask them in the comments and we'll get to them. Before you install your, uh, your Hatermatic at the local coffee shop, bar, comic book store, library, 
Christian Science Reading Room. Wherever people need to be. Wherever assaulted. people, yes, wherever people congregate. Um, you want to make sure it's someplace busy. Uh, before you do that, though, you might want to check with your local laws and just make sure that uh, charging people for abuse is not, uh, not against local regulations. We are not lawyers. Do we have a lawyer in the building? Um, we have one on retainer. We do. Enough wacky stuff goes on here that we occasionally need good legal advice. What are you looking for, Mike? <laughs> this. Ah. <laughs> yes. And that is the story of my life. Do you want to put a heat shrink on there? Nope. <laughs> like I said, uh, that pin, uh, we're just going to slide. We can just slide the heat shrink over. Um, and, uh, and I'll just do a quick demo of, of using the soldering iron tip. You just kind of work it back and forth. Rotate that around a little bit. And one of the things that you'll notice when you do this, uh, or if you use a, uh, a cigarette lighter or matches or whatever else, um, you end up with like schmutz on there. And it discolors the, uh, it discolors the heat shrink. And uh, you know, it just kind of looks a little crappy. So that's, that's why I like to avoid doing that. Um, hot air gun, totally the way to go. The other neat thing about a hot air gun uh, that that gets you is the ability to desolder things, uh, particularly surface mount chips, really easily. Um, you just get the board good and hot with your hot air gun and uh, whack it on a table and off comes all of the parts that you heated up enough. Um, it's also a reasonable way to fix broken electronics. A lot of times things, uh, electronics will break because a solder, <coughs> solder joint goes or, or something similar to that. So um, you can use the, the heat gun to reflow some of the solder joints on a, on a bad, for instance, Xbox. Um, and that may bring the device back to life. You can also pop it in your oven, but. Again, we are not lawyers. Yes. We're also not chefs. Um, so uh, at this point, we've got, uh, we have our ends on everything. We've got our ends on. We've got our board, uh, our, our header pins on the Arduino. The board is populated. Um, so now it's ready. We're ready to start doing some, uh, some physical assembly of these parts. Um, so I am going to uh, grab my extra red box that I laser cut for this. Uh, incidentally, the files for this are on in the GitHub repository. There is a file in there, uh, an SVG file for Inkscape that will uh, that has the appropriate spacing for the holes, the right shape the size for the button, the size for the printer. So all of those things are in there. So if you want to laser cut them or print them out on a sheet of paper and uh, lay them down over something and use a, an X-Acto knife or something like that to cut a shape out of a cardboard box. Cardboard might not be the best thing. It's not exactly theft proof, uh, but you know, you use what you can. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and install the coin acceptor in this. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do that as the next step is because we need to, uh, we need to calibrate this coin acceptor, basically teach it to recognize the different types of coins that we are going to use. Um, for me, I use nickels, I, pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Um, it could also accept dollar coins. It could probably even accept 50 cent pieces. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a six denomination acceptor. And I think you kind of have to accept 50 cent pieces if you're going to get to six. And it would be a good insult. Uh, what, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, th that actually is not a bad insult, a 50 cent piece. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in order to install this, there's a little screw on the side here. And when you undo the screw, it 
you can take the faceplate off. And that makes it about a million times easier to put in because this uh, is a little bit larger than the hole that it needs to go, that it would need to go through. And you can, you like, you can kind of, you kind of finagle it in there and wiggle it and turn it the right way and get it through sometimes, maybe, depending on how thick the material is. Um, but the ability to, like, when you can just take that off, yeah, the, um, don't, don't do what I've done and, and not do that. Um, so lay that over the holes right there. Uh, it comes with hardware for assembly. And uh, the nice thing about this hardware, these are, it comes with these sort of carriage bolt type screws um, so that you, you, the, uh, somebody on the outside of the box can't just unscrew it. And you can see that they have a, that sort of square head that a carriage bolt will have and they fit down into these square holes on here. So that's kind of handy. So it'll make your cardboard box nearly theft-proof. Yes. Airtight security around here. Um, I'm going to get rid of these washers because I don't believe in washers. <laughs> um, so we flip it over. Got it. We've got our screws on the back sticking through. Um, tighten them down. If you're doing it like I am on cardboard, um, it be a little... Uh, a little parsimonious about your tightening here. You don't want to over tighten these and, and tear a hole in that cardboard box. Pretty sure this is metric hardware, so if you lose some of it, uh, your life is going to be harder <laughs> than necessary. I'd like one miniature metric carriage bolt, please. Yes. Spent some fruitless time at the hardware store this weekend looking for a, uh, a metric machine pin for a, uh, a piece of IKEA furniture that I have. Metric machine? Yeah, true story. Wow. I ended up getting a quarter inch uh, um, imperial and just pounding it into place with a hammer. So we've got our, our front plate installed. We can slip this guy in. Like a glove. Like a glove. Okay. Um, one other nice thing about the uh, the cardboard box method is that you can uh, you can disassemble things a little bit here, which you, you're going to have to do to get to that screw. to get to that okay. screw that we took out earlier. So before you, uh, before you uh, create a, an enclosure for this, give a little thought to how you're going to, uh, how you're going to access things like, whoops, wrong hole, uh, to access things like that during assembly. Um, you know, my, my personal favorite idea is to build a front panel that can be removed with a couple of easily accessible screws so that I can do all the assembly on it, put it in, and then screw it back into place. Um, so, one other thing that we can do with this guy, would be nice and tricky. We can just open up this end, and that gives us access to it, which is something that I did on my, uh, on my original over here. So, now I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this up again. And we've got, we have our coin acceptor floating out here in space. Um, and uh, we have to begin the calibration process now. 
Um, so there's so there's one thing that you want to do before you do the calibration. I f I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. There's a little dip switch on on here, and uh, the third of those dip switches should be turned on, which is to say pushed up. The other three should remain in the off position that they originally are in when you receive the uh, the device. So. Um, find your power leads, which is the red and the black one. Uh, if you're colorblind like me, that doesn't help because the green one looks, is that green? What is that? Are there two reds? Um, nope. This one's black and this one's red. You people in your colors. I know. Um, so you find these two and uh, we're just going to go ahead and um, plug this into our breadboard. You can see on here where I put in the, the 12 and the 9. Um, 5 and the 9? Or the, the, no, 12 and 9. Oh, 12 and 9. My bad. Um, there is a fritzing diagram online that will show you where you need to plug these things in. Uh, if you look, I'm just going to pull this off. There are three pins on this, uh, on this barrel jack. And the one at the very end is the positive, and the one that's kind of buried in the middle here is the, uh, the ground terminal from that. This other one that's on the side will be connected to ground when there's no barrel plug inserted. And when you, unplug, when you um, put, a, put a plug in there, that one goes floating. Uh, you can use that to select out a battery load if you connected a battery, uh, the positive and negative of a battery terminals, like if you connect the, uh, the negative terminal of the battery pack to that switched pin, when you plug something in, it'll take that switched pin out of the circuit and disconnect the battery pack. Um, that's a, it's a handy little trick that uh, I think a lot of people don't use. Um, so you want to make sure that you are hooking it to the right, uh, to the right pins. So I'm going to hook my 12 volt power up, and you should hear some uh, some fun sounds. And you can see here on this, there's this little display, that uh, a little seven segment display. Um, with two buttons next to it. Uh, there's one towards the back of the device that's, yeah, we can point it towards the camera here. Uh, so there's one towards the back of the device labeled B, and one towards the front of the, or towards the back, I guess, is, is A, and towards the front is B. Um, the settings that you need to change with uh, to get this to work properly, all of the interface is done through those two buttons. Um, it's quite a, a cunning little uh, user interface. So the first thing that we're going to do, I'm going to pull up my, uh, my instructions on GitHub. The GitHub wiki actually has, has these instructions uh, in full on it because uh, they're kind of, uh, if you look at the manual for this thing, it, it's, um, it's a little unclear what they're asking you to do in some cases. Um, so I've gone ahead and created a, a walkthrough on the wiki on the GitHub repository for how to set up the, uh, the coin acceptor. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do here, I shouldn't have closed my computer because that, uh, I've lost my GitHub repository page. Um, so the first thing that we need to do, if I can remember this properly, we're going to press and hold the B button. And then you'll see the display will flicker and it'll go to AP. When it's at a, when it says AP, you press the, uh, the A button until you see A2. Then you press the B button, and you'll see the display change. It'll, there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. When it comes, it'll probably be in 2. 
this is how you set the baud rate on this. Um, the baud rate we're going to use is, uh, is 9600 BPS, which is when this says 01. So what we do is we go to 01, and then you press and hold A, and it'll go to 88, and then it'll go back to 00. zero. And when it's back on 00, zero, if you insert a coin, you'll see the value of the coin come up on the display. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to train it uh, to, uh, to recognize the different denominations of coin that we want to use. This is a monumental pain in the butt because you have to feed in uh, something like 20 different coins in order to calibrate it properly. I've gotten away, like when I trained this thing on quarters, I put, I think, six quarters in, and I just kept feeding the quarters through over and over, and eventually it got the message. Um, but uh, the really painful thing is that when you're doing that, the coins don't come out in the underside. They come out of the, the uh, coin return. And so you have to take, you can put in one or two or three, and then you got to take them out. And then you put in one or two or three, and then you got to take them out. So it's kind of a hassle. Um, in order to, to, to train that, the first thing that you've got to do, you hold down the, B, the A button this time. And when you hold down the A button, uh, eventually you'll hear that beep, and the display will say CP. Um, at this point, if you hold the B button down for a little while, uh, you'll get another beep. And the uh, and uh, and the the display will change, and at that point you'll know that uh, you've reset the coin parameters. You really want to do this before you start uh, trying to teach it new coins, because if you don't, it's not going to learn the new coins properly. But now we're on CP. You press the A button again. It'll say C1. C1 is the first denomination. You can press the coin acceptor or the, the button A a few more times and it'll go C1 through 6 and then back to CP. Um, when you're on a coin, like say on C1, if you press the B button, it'll bring up the value of the coin. In this case, C1 is pennies, so I've got it set to 0, 1. Um, when it's Set to 0, 1, you can change the setting by pressing uh, the B button. That will increase that, and you can increase it anywhere from, it can be anywhere from 0 to 100. Uh, 100 is noted A0, and, uh, which is basically hexadecimal. Um, so you can set it to whatever value you want. Like I said, I've set pennies to 1, nickels to 5, dimes to 10, and quarters to 25. Um, once it's set to the value that you want, just start feeding in coins. Feeding in coins. Um, when it makes that sound and does that, that's it telling you that it has finished learning that coin and will go on to the next one. Then you want to press the buttons until, uh, until you press the B button until your next denomination is set. And then you go through and you throw in coins of that value. And each time you throw it in, it's going to make a clink clink sound. And then uh, you can teach it all of those coins. I've already done that because it's a, an extremely noisy, extremely unpleasant process that takes uh, five or 10 minutes to go through. Um, First world problems. Yeah. So now we've taught our coin acceptor to accept coins. One thing before I leave that, uh, before I leave that topic for good that I want to mention, while you're training it, it's important that this coin acceptor be as upright as possible. And it should be, well, I say upright. It should be in the same orientation that it's going to be during the, uh, during the actual application. Um, when you start feeding coins in, there's something, uh, there's something in there that is like a lever arm and something about the weight of the coin that is important to the identification of the coin. And if you've got this thing sitting at a wonky angle, the, uh, the calibration values will not come out right, and you'll get a lot of false rejects on the coins. Hmm.
So now we're in here, we've got this thing set. You can see if I feed a quarter in, it drops out the bottom and then we'll get a 25 on the display here. So we're all set up from that perspective. We already set up the baud rate on this. So uh, we're ready to go ahead and connect the, uh, the wires up. Um, let's see if I've got GitHub back yet. So uh, we've got on the GitHub, in the GitHub repository, we have a, uh, a fritzing diagram and there's actually this fritzing schematic is in there and so we've created the the big arcade button, we've got the, the thermal printer was actually already uh, available as a part of fritzing. Um, and then we've also created the coin acceptor as a fritzing part so that you can uh, put these things into your own designs. We've got this on the breadboard so that we can see how, to, how, the, uh, how the whole thing gets assembled. Um, so, and while you're starting that, we actually do have a question. Um, this is from Tony DeCola, and he wants to know, could you cook a pizza with a heat gun? with sufficient patience. I'm wondering if by the time you got one side done and moved to the other side, if the first side wouldn't be so cold that it wouldn't be worth it. Well, I would, I would put it in a insulated box and put the heat gun and then you oh. just make an oven so and use the, the, the convention. Yes, exactly. Okay. Although this does, uh, this does relate nicely to the discussion we had the other day um, about how much heat energy a pizza can store and how large of a pizza you would have to have to store enough heat energy in that pizza to cook another pizza. You just blew my mind. Yes. <laughs> yes, folks, this was a discussion that we had at SparkFun. Um, so uh, we've got three signals, three remaining signals coming out of this, out of our, uh, out of our coin acceptor. Um, one of them is inhibit, which your microcontroller can use to tell the coin acceptor to reject any coin that is inserted at that time. Um, and we're actually going to use that signal to reject coins uh, during the period where we're printing out a, an insult because we don't want to miss a coin that gets inserted during that period. Um, because it takes some time to print out the insult, and while we're printing an insult, we run into that, uh, into that resource limitation with the serial, uh, software serial port. So while we're using the software serial port to print our insult, we can't use the software serial port to watch the, uh, the coin acceptor. So we need the coin acceptor to reject anything that gets inserted during that time. Um, there's another one. Let's see here, there's a signal. So this white one is, uh, is termed signal on here. And this uh, can be one of two different inputs uh, or outputs. It can either be a, uh, a serial value out or it can be a pulse that uh, it will do one pulse on this line for every count that a coin is worth. So for instance, a penny, it would do one pulse, a nickel, it would do five, a dime, 10, and a quarter, 25. For this example, um, the reason why I'm not just counting pulses, I'm actually using the serial, is because the pulses get kinda long. Um, if I were doing 25, the minimum pulse length, I think the shortest is like 40 microseconds. Uh, and so 25 ticks at 40 microseconds is, is, is quite a while, right? I mean, at that, at that pulse length, you can actually feed in coins faster than the thing can, can uh, output the data about the coins. Um, microseconds or milliseconds? Milliseconds. It's long. Hmm. It's surprisingly long. Wow. Um, so of course, if you, uh, you know, you could just have it um, output one for pennies, two for nickels, three for dimes, and four for quarters. Um, but I like the thought of just being able to add without doing any math to it, just being able to add that to my, uh, to my value and know that I'm getting in on it. And okay, now I've got 50 cents in the machine. Okay, now I've got 75 cents in the machine. So the signal line, Actually, I didn't mention inhibit. Should go to pin nine on the Arduino. 
the signal line goes to pin 7 on the Arduino. And now we've got one left. This is called counter. Um, I don't remember what counter does. Uh, <laughs> And I don't care what counter does because I'm not going to use it. I did go ahead and put a pin on here because I want this to behave itself when I've finished assembly. So I'm just going to go ahead and jam that someplace in the breadboard where it's not going to connect to anything. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and install our, uh, our printer here. And I'm going to unplug the, uh, the power before I go any further. So we're going to unplug the printer, uh, the, the power. To install the printer, um, it comes with, where did my screwdriver go? It comes with these little ear things that slide into these channels on the end. And uh, they slide into these channels, and then there's a screw that, th that drops through this ear. And again, from the front, the the bezel that's on here is is completely smooth there's no screws there's no anything that a, a would-be vandal can can get a hold of to try and remove this thing um, so again airtight security on this cardboard box <laughs> um, the other really good thing about the way that assembly is is that it means that even if you uh, e even if your hole is cut to the exact same size as this this just slides in and then you put the connectors on from the back and uh, and thread it into place so we're going to go ahead and do that oops While Mike's doing that, I'll just mention that we're over here in a corner of the SparkFun classroom, and we're not the only people doing stuff in here. We've, we've got a team over on the other side. We've got uh, Casey and Sean working on something called the Great American Tweet Race. Is yes, that right? Yes, we have a poster board. It's just not been mounted yet. We have the Great American Tweet Race. The Great Amer American Tweet Race. Can you see the whole thing? This basically has four, I would say horses, except they're badgers. Honey badgers. Honey badgers. Five honey badgers. And what you do is you enter in five um, hashtags, and you start a race, and it, in real time, looks at what's happening on Twitter, the real time traffic. And for every hashtag that one of those racers gets, it lurches ahead. And eventually, one of them will get it at the end. So, wh what are what are the hashtags you guys have been doing so far? Well, these are our test hashtags. We got hello, omg, blessed, fml, and I'm trying to remember what this talker was. That display's not working for us. It's I think DIY is a is a is a popular one. So, so fml blessed, DIY, DIY hello, and omg. And and which one seems to be winning the most races? Blessed right now. It's kind of funny. I guess <laughs> Okay. I, I know Bieber has been a good one at times. Oh, we should try, we should try Bieber versus Miley Cyrus. Bieber. Bieber, Bieber versus Cyrus. So so how many, like how many Beliebers we got out there? <laughs> you kids these cool. days. Thanks, guys. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, back to our assembly. Um, so. I've gone ahead and plugged in the value, the uh, the connectors to the back of the printer. Um, I'm going to bring those back over here. Uh, so the in this case again, we've got uh, f an output signal on the printer, which is the uh, this guy here. So we've got an output transmit line, an input receive line, and a ground. Uh, I put the ground over here to the negative rail on this on this breadboard. I've taken the transmit line out of here and just kind of st again stuck that into a random place on my breadboard where it's not going to be connected to anything, just so that I can uh, 
just so I can keep tabs on it and know that it's not going to be wandering around uh, brushing up against something inappropriate. Um, and now I'm going to take my power lines, the red and the black, and I'm going to connect those over here to my 9 volt input. Um, The, uh, the signal line has its own ground reference line, and so I'm not actually going to connect the, uh, the ground line of this, uh, of this barrel jack to the ground rail that I've created over here. I'm just going to go ahead and leave that alone. Um, and then the next thing that I'm going to do, um, so I've got these guys plugged in here. They're plugged into this. The next thing that I need to do is I need to power up my Arduino. Um, the Arduino, we've got a couple of, uh, couple of things here. So the Arduino can accept up to a 12 volt input. And so I'm going to connect the ground to that rail. I'm going to connect the VN, oh, and I'm noticing something about my, my breadboard here. This breadboard has seen better days, and so there's some dead channels on the, uh, on the board. So I'm just going to go ahead and move my, uh, move my whole thing down a couple. Yeah, that, that's something we forget to check a lot of times is whether your breadboard's working or not. But sometimes if you've debugged every possible source of problems, you find that it's actually the breadboard that's the issue. And just moving your part down a row or two usually clears that up. Uh, and I will frequently just destroy a breadboard <laughs> that um, is bad uh, because I might, I mean, the three or four dollars or whatever it is, my, my life, the amount of time that it takes out of my life uh, to troubleshoot that is worth more than that, two or three bucks to me. The gray hair associated with it, yeah. too. Um, or you can give them to people you don't like. That's evil. Well, we are making an insult generator. Well, that's so. true. Um, so my 12 volt, I'm going to go ahead and pull power from the 12 volt. I'm connecting that. So I've got my, uh, and you can look at the, um, oops, you can look at the schematic on here. Um, but what I've done is I've got the, uh, the 12 volts is feeding the, both the coin acceptor and the Arduino. And the 9 volts is feeding only the insult or the uh, pr the printer, the insult printer, um, and so now we've got one last uh, component to put in place, and that is our big green push button. Um, in the t in the uh, the wish list, I suggested using these little guys, these spade connectors, um, especially if you're doing something with this guy like a, uh, uh, like a, a MAME arcade cabinet or something like that, you really probably want to use these things. Um, y you know, y you might just as easily solder the wires directly on here. Uh, and in fact, that's what I'm going to do because it would actually, it's actually going to take me less time to do that. Um, because I solder an awful lot. Um, so you're going to connect these to the, to the common pin and the normally open pin. Uh, those are the connections that you want to make for this. Another reason Mike can do this is because one of the ends of the connection is to the breadboard anyway. So you can always undo it from that end. What you want to be careful of is soldering both ends of a wire to two different things, especially when you have to put it into a, a front panel. Then you're going to be unsoldering something sooner or later. Um, these guys are kind of nice. That comes off. Unscrew this. Uh, 
slip that guy on through that hole. Screw that in. Uh, pop this bad boy back in place. And there we go. So now these guys are kind of short. Um, we've put ourselves on kind of a short leash here. Uh, but that's, you know, that's OK. Um, so according to my fritzing diagram, I'm going to put these on A0. I'm going to use the, I'm going to use A0. I'm going to use the internal pull-up resistors to detect when this thing is closed. So it's going to go from A0. One of them is going to go to A0, and one of them is going to go to ground. It doesn't matter which one is which in this case. Um, but now we've got the whole thing more or less assembled. Um, so at this point, uh, we can apply power. Let's see. Make sure you get the right voltage in the right, right hole. Yep. Here's our 12 volt. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if we have the internet access, if we've got the computer showing up. Can you guys pull up my computer so that I can show the code? Or is that? Uh, yeah. I'll go take a look. Okay. Here Mike is uh, is our resident uh, genius. genius when it comes to the whole uh, broadcast system. Um, so it's unusual for him to be in front of the camera. He's usually behind the camera. If you've seen any of our Spark Fun videos or anything uh, in the, that takes place in the classroom, he probably, uh, the, the streaming um, classes and, and lunch and learn topics and things like that, he's usually the one who uh, is behind the camera and controlling the board filming that. Um, so. Uh, I've got this stuff all kind of hooked up and wired into place here. I'm going to go ahead and plug in my in hub? power hub supplies. Sweet. Thank you. Um, and now you can see, uh, we've forgotten that. OK, you'll see, uh, what you should see is you should see one blinking light on the front of this uh, on the front of this guy. I don't see that right now because I uh, don't have paper in there. So I'm going to steal the paper from my original working one. And we're going to throw it in there. Paper feed mechanism for this is really simple. You just put it in, close the door on it, and leave a little tag end hanging out. No, nothing to thread through, no complicated things uh, there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hook, my, uh, hook up my uh, little FTDI basic is what I'm using. I'm using a 5 volt FTDI basic. We sell FTDI cables, which have this same six pin uh, header on the end of them and just have a USB port on the other end. Um, there's all kinds of solutions out there uh, for this now that you can use. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and use the FTDI basic. Um, plug that in. So there's a little beep beep sound. Um, go ahead and have we got my computer? Nope. OK. Not yet. Um, go ahead and connect and. Did the utility stop? Well, remember, I was dumb and I closed my lid of my computer yeah, and it went to sleep. sleep. And so I restarted that utility. Okay. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and upload my code. The code upload is, is actually quite long. Um, and that's because the uh, unlike most things, we've got a lot of, of memory. We've got a lot of stuff stored in the memory here. We've got the insult <coughs> strings. And then it's actually uploading at half the speed of an Arduino uh, Uno or a similar, uh, similar one. Let's see here. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and of course, I, <laughs> as it is prone to being, not getting any life here. Mike, do you want to get up and do a little soft chew or something? Yeah. Ah, I see the problem. I had pulled my uh, I pulled my barrel jack out partially. Let's see. Double check my connections. Seven. There's my problem. Got those backwards. So, uh, <laughs> I'll hit reset again. When the, uh, when the Arduino code starts running, the first thing that it's going to do is print you out a receipt that says, hello world. Um, that's just kind of a heartbeat to let you know what's going on. Uh, then, once you get hello world, you can kind of at that point assume that you're, uh, that you're alive, that you're, you're, uh, your board is breathing. Um, the next step, of course, feed in a quarter, press the button, might, there we go. I installed my button backwards. <laughs> Live TV, folks. <laughs> that one's got to be connected. Uh, so this goes back to what I said earlier about uh, hot gluing those barrel jacks down. That's a really great idea because what keeps happening here is uh, is my my barrel jack is is uh, is coming unplugged and I'm losing my my power supply and that is causing me a great deal of angst. A zero. Let's see. So troubleshooting now, um, for some reason, I'm, I'm throwing in change. My coin acceptor is giving me the right values when I throw in a coin. Um, but for some reason, uh, when I push the insult button, I'm not getting, uh, I'm not getting any insults. And uh, that's, that's disappointing because, you know, we, uh, we all came here today to see an insult machine. Um, so this brings me uh, to an interest area, to a, to a useful uh, code feature that I put in there. Uh, I put in a debug mode, which uh, when you sure enable the mic. debug mode, okay, good, Mike's gonna, the other mic is going to uh, <laughs> demo the code. Um, then the output from the serial port the output is redirected from the printer to the serial port. And it also will print out the value of the coin on your serial port connection so you can see whether or not you're getting, uh, getting the coin that you thought you inserted. Let's see, white. Oh man, I, my, conne my connections are all messed up here. That's what's going on. So that must have happened when I uh, when I rearranged okay. this for the Good call, guys. to fix the breadboard uh, offset issue. So now you can see um, inexplicably we are rejecting a coin. Okay, and now we're working because I had some uh, some stuff uh, 
a lot of my connections are, are bad. Um, so this also highlights a, uh, a dilemma or a, a danger of working with breadboards. Um, the whole time that I'm working here, every time I move anything, it pulls a connection out of my breadboard. Um, so if you are going to build this and you're going to make it something that you have permanently uh, on display in your house or at the hackerspace or wherever, um, I strongly suggest uh, that you do something like maybe one of our mini solderable breadboards, um, the ones that uh, we just recent re recently released. Um, those are a really great option for something like this where you want to put these things together and, uh, and leave them be. Um, and the cool thing about those is that the layout matches the breadboard. So once you have it working on a breadboard, you can just move it directly over to the solder, the solder board. And the fritzing diagram applies directly to it as well. So, uh, so it's, it's a, nice, a nice thing. Um, and if you really like your circuit, go ahead and make a PCB for it and have something like Osh Park or one of the other board houses make it for yeah, you. Absolutely. Um, so now uh, you can see we're fully operational. Um, it may be that the purpose of your life is solely to be a warning to others. I like that one. <laughs> um, we can go over the code a yeah. little bit here. Uh, Mike, would you like to, do you want to do that, or would you like me to? Why don't you walk through it where, you, where you'd like to point out some stuff. Okay. Um, so the code, uh, as I may have mentioned earlier, uh, the code does not depend on any uh, unusual uh, libraries or anything like that. There's nothing to download, nothing to install. It uses the built-in software serial library. It uses... Um, and include uh, avr slash pgm space dot h. That adds support for storing data in the flash memory that the program is normally stored in. Ah. And, and why do we need to do that? We need to do that because if we were to try just putting all of these things, uh, if we if we put these strings in just normally, they could take up a lot of uh, SRAM space. And we only have about two kilobytes of SRAM, but we have um, something like 32 kilobytes of, of flash memory. So the extra space that we have in the flash memory uh, allows us to store far more strings and uh, avoid, avoid overwriting other data. Um, with our with our strings, which would cause the program to crash and behave in strange ways. Um, so, uh, there, I, I suppose if you were uh, if you were a glutton for punishment, you could um, you could do this with a, a micro SD card. Oh yeah. And uh, in that case, it would be easy to add strings. But you could have a text file on the micro SD card and just write data to that uh, text file and copy it. You know, co pull it from there. Um, there's it. Uh, all of the strings are stored in a .h a, a header file called insultstrings.h. Um, and uh, let's swing over to insultstrings.h and take a look at that really quickly. Okay. Um, you'll see that for each level of insult, <laughs> as it were, because the more money you spend, the better the insult you get is, there is an, uh, there's an, a number of uh, insults for that level. So there's a, uh, a define that you set to the number of insults for, for instance, the quote unquote value level insults. Um, those are things that are from five cents to nine cents. Um, so then it gets kind of weird. Uh, there's this, you have to define each one of the variables, or each one of the strings has to be defined as an array, and that array has to be told, you have to tell the, uh, the compiler to store that array in the flash memory. That's what the prog mem directive tells it. Um, and then you create an array of arrays, if that's not too redundant, or a pointer array. Uh, um, and, uh, and then each one of those strings is a member of that array. So by doing that, you tell it 
you want to create, you want to put all of these things into memory, and then in additional, in addition to doing so, you want to put in memory the location of all, in the flash memory, the location of all of those strings so that everything gets stored in flash memory. Now, it looks like that's sort of a double, uh, like a redundant step where you're putting in, um, you create this variable that only gets used in initializing this other, uh, this other variable. But you have to do that if you try just to put the strings directly in the, uh, in the array structure um, without creating that second value, uh, at which I actually have an example of how I originally did it at the bottom of this, of this file. Um, what it will do is it will store those arrays, the insults, it will store those in SRAM and then put a pointer uh, uh, the address of that in the SRAM, it'll store that in the flash. So you don't end up with almost any savings of memory at all. So um, look at the example code, do it the way I did it there, don't make my uh, same mistakes. Um, back going back to the, uh, to the main Hatermatic code, um, you can see I, I did some pin redefinitions. So coin input, uh, goes to pin 7, printer output goes to pin 8, get insult, which comes from the button, goes uh, to pin A0, and the inhibit output to the coin acceptor to stop it from accepting any coins goes to pin 9. Uh, I create a software serial port um, that is tied to the coin input and printer output pins, and then Oh, um, so you're splitting one port between two ex devices. Exactly. I split the one port between the two devices. Um, and uh, to do that, I simply uh, did the, uh, I did a define. If you go down a little bit more there, you'll see where I have a define coin input and printer output. And I just define that to be both of those SWSER. Oh. So it's easy to see in the code where I'm, writing to the printer or reading from the coin acceptor um, without, uh, without mixing the two of them up. I'm still only using one instance of the software serial port. Uh, I created my debug mode where if my debug mode is one, um, I redirect the printer output from the software serial port by undefining that software serial port definition and redirect it to the standard hardware serial port. That way you can do your testing without feeding out miles of receipts. Oh, um, th that's kind of a nice way to do it and that all you have to do in that case is go to uh, is set debug equal to one. Uh, we'll see a little bit later how I implemented that. So uh, we go down into setup and in setup, I did serial begin 57.6. That's the hardware serial. Um, and then regardless of what else is going on, I go ahead and dump a hello world over the serial port uh, to the computer. Just sanity check, am I alive? Did I come online? Is everything OK? Um, the next is. Uh, and you'll see these things throughout the code. You'll see if debug is equal to zero and if. So if, if I'm actually debugging, then I need to begin my software serial port at 19.2 and feed is a, is a small function that I wrote that just pushes a few, it basically hits the return key four times and, and throws a few lines out of the printer because otherwise uh, you find yourself trying to tear off really tiny little receipts and it's nice to have a little bit more to grab a hold of. So this basically. Yes, yeah, so that's why there's so much space in between those, uh, the printed out receipts. Um, then we go on and we print hello world out on the sheet of paper, again, just to make sure that things are working. And then we go back to, uh, we go back to an if debug 
we feed a little bit more paper out. And then this part uh, is kind of weird. Um, I'm ending my software serial port. And the reason that I'm doing that, it comes up there and then there's a little bit further down, you'll see where I do uh, coin input dot begin 9600. The coin acceptor is running at 9600 baud, the printer is running at 192. So I have to constantly be trading off between the two and telling the software serial port uh, what baud rate it should be using. Should it be using 9600 to listen to the coin acceptor or 192 to talk to the printer? Um, you can reconfigure the printer to operate at 9600 baud that would eliminate this need for the soft for the serial port uh, transitioning I didn't uh, you know I kind of looked at the the data sheet for the printer and I just didn't feel like trying to figure out how to do that so I just did this this is I knew how to do this yeah I knew how to do this I would I figured it would be a simpler way to do it so and then we have our pin mode setups, uh, get insult, input pull up. Like I said earlier, we set that as an input pull up because then when somebody pushes the button, it pulls the button to ground. We look for a uh, if digital read that button low, then we know that the button is pushed. Pin mode inhibit, we make that an output so that we can tell the coin acceptor when we don't want it to accept change. And then we're gonna go ahead and digital write the inhibit high because most of the time we don't wanna be rejecting coins. Down in the loop, we have a variable, which is a static unsigned int called cashola. So as a static unsigned int, cashola can store up to 65,535 coin input, or cents, I guess. So That's if somebody, it is a lot of cash. So if somebody wanted to sit here and feed $655 worth of coins into this machine, we've got them covered. Um, I bet you get a hell of an insult for that one. Uh, yeah, I actually, I should put one in there that you only get at 65,500. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, cashola is a static variable. Um, in this case, the static variable will get set once at zero. And then on every further iteration of the loop function, that will not get overwritten, not get reinitialized. It will maintain its value from one uh, iteration of loop to the next. So that avoids me having to use a global variable that is located outside. I can make it a static variable and put it inside of the loop function. And uh, that is generally the preferred method for doing those things. It, uh, it avoids pollution of the namespace. It limits the scope of the variable, so a variable, so a function that you don't need um, to have access to that variable can't accidentally overwrite it. Um, you don't pollute the namespace that way so that if you have another function someplace else that you want to use a different value called cashola, you can do that. Um, so it's a good habit. It's a good habit. It's a good practice to get in. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the way grown-ups program. Um, so the next thing is my if coin input dot available is greater to equal greater than zero. So that's basically looking at the software serial port uh, from input from the coin acceptor and trying to see if that has received any uh, any data. If it has received it, um, then I grab that data and I add it to Cashola, but only if the value is not equal to negative one. And the reason for that is because the coin acceptor has got a, a glitch in its serial output. For some reason, um, when I throw nickels or dimes in uh, and it tries to output a 5 or a 10, it, uh, you get a framing error, which means you get just a little bit of extra data at the end. And the software serial port doesn't like that frame error. It treats that little extra tag end of data as a new bit. And so you'll get a five, and then you'll get one more value. And because of the binary encoding of that value, it will come in as negative one. So um, until I put this catch in there, when I put a nickel in, I would see, uh, I would see the count go up by four instead of by five. And that was, that was really annoying. Um, and uh, so, there's this if it's not equal to negative one, uh, 
I do this peak rather than read um, because peak allows me to check the value before I actually take it off the buffer. If it's not equal to negative one, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to add it to cashola. If it is equal to negative one, I'm just going to pull it out of the buffer and throw it away. So then after that if value or after that if, uh, if statement, we go down to our uh, the if digital read get insult is low and cashola is greater than zero. You don't want people to be able to get a uh, to get an insult for free if they push the button. Cheap well, skates. yeah, I mean, but cheapskate is what you get when you put in a penny oh. or less than a nickel. I so, think it is. So they're lower than a cheapskate. They're lower than a cheapskate. <gasps> we could just have it print cool. a blank sheet of paper for those losers. But then you're still, I mean, you're losing paper. Um, anyway. Um, before we do anything else, we take inhibit low so that it's going to reject any additional coins. Um, then we check our timestamp, uh, the, the millis timestamp. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because given the, the nature of this input, you can be reasonably certain that from one button press to another, it's going to be some weird number of milliseconds other than, you know, between those two uh, button presses. And so we can, for purposes of this, treat that as a fairly good random number. Um, the random functionality within Arduino uh, has been a little sketchy lately. I've seen, uh, if you watched the last SparkFun Live, you'll know Tony had some problems with the pickup line uh, generator um, doing some bad things. I don't know what it, the, the, it was always giving her, I think, a zero or a one as a random value. And that, that's not helpful. I mean. Not for a pickup line generator. Uh, no. That's a critical function. Yes. So. Um, so we take that uh, we take that millis value and we pluck off the low end of it, and then uh, we look at that low end, and we're going to pass that low end down a little further. You'll see there's a there's an if else loop where is you know if cashola is greater than zero and less than five we go to cheap strings, greater than or equal to five less than ten greater than or equal to ten less than twenty five greater than twenty five, and then we pass along that value of the low end of the uh, of the millis. Uh, modulo the number of strings that we have for that insult level, and that generates a value that, that gives us a value from that random number, which is within the range of the number of strings that we have. Um, reset our cashola amount. If we are not debugging, reset it to uh, looking for coin inputs and release the inhibit line. Then we get down here into our actual string printing functions. Uh, the cheap strings, uh, if you don't put in at least a nickel, all you get is cheapskate because that's what you are. <laughs> um, one thing about that uh, to, to note about that uh, about that print line statement there, you see where it, it, it has the F and the parentheses around. That tells it to store that string in memory. That's sort of a shortcut way of doing it. It works great in a situation like this where you've got a print line statement with one thing that you're going to print. It doesn't work so well in a situation like the other situations where you want to go out and fetch a random string, bring it back, and then print it out. Um, so we'll look at the value strings and how that gets handled. Uh, value strings creates a character buffer 150, uh, 150 characters deep. And then it uses the string copy underscore p function, um, which is part of that avr slash pgm space dot h uh, library that we in, uh, in, uh, grabbed earlier. Uh, it takes the buffer that we created a moment ago, and it takes the location past the list location and the string select value that we created up above, and it goes to the space in program memory 
that's defined by those two pieces of information grabs that data out of flash memory, stuffs it into that buffer, and then we can do a standard print line of that buffer and dump that data out to the printer or to the serial port if we're in debug mode. Um, it's kind of awful, the typecasting and the uh, dereferencing and things that are going on there. Um, I'm not going to get into it right now because it is terrible. There, there's um, some, some, some real uh, backflips and double backflips and somersaults to get to that data. If you find yourself wanting to do something like this, look for an example. Use this example. Just copy it, and you should be fine. Yeah. Some, um, sometimes you have to jump through hoops when you're moving memory around, so it, right. it can get ugly. Yeah, it can get very ugly. I mean, you're, you're creating a variable that points to another. It's, it's, um, it's obtuse. Um, but that's pretty much it. Uh, once you've gotten past that point, there's just uh, we, we've done a couple more functions to do the higher quality functions. And then at the very bottom is that feed function that I mentioned earlier, which does nothing but print out four new lines. And that feeds out a little bit more data, uh, a little more paper out of your printer. So one more time, we'll throw in a few coins. Print ourselves out a little bad karma. If all the village idiots left their villages and formed their own village, in that village, you would be the village idiot. Wise advice. <laughs> and with that, we will leave you until the next episode of Spark Fun Live. This is Mike signing off. And Mike signing off, saying that your mother was a hamster. And your father smelt of elderberries. Have a good one. Got her all. Is that all?